No. Can we start, Kalina? Oh, okay. Sure. So, good morning to everyone. Good evening, David. <laughs> uh, on behalf of the SB Cards Steering Committee, we welcome you, Professor David Lowe, to the 11th edition of CBSoft, the Brazilian Conference on Software Theory and Practice. Before we start, let me just introduce you, David, to, to the audience. Uh, professor David Lowe is a professor of computer science at the Singapore Management University, where he leads the Soft Analytics Research Group. His research lies in the intersection of soft engineering, artificial intelligence, and cybersecurity, including socio-technical aspects and analysis of different software artifacts in order to improve software quality, security, in developer productivity. His work has been published in premier conference and journals on the subject, and he has more than 50 international research and service awards, including six ACM SIGSOFT Distinguished Paper Awards and the prestigious 2021 Distinguished Service Award from the IEEE Technical Committee on soft engineering. So David, it's a pleasure to receive you here and thanks for accepting this invitation. And if you're ready, I think that you can start. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo, for a very nice introduction. And also thank you, uh, Karina, for the arrangements. And also I'd like to thank uh, all the steering committee and organizing committee of CBSoft and also SBCARS uh, for inviting me to give this uh, keynote. So I'm certainly very happy and honored to give the keynote. Please allow me to share my screen and please uh, allow me to confirm if you are able to see my screen. Uh, is it uh, visible, the screen? Yes, okay, sounds good, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, yes, so I will, yeah, so I will present this uh, talk entitled Living with Box and How AI Can Help. But before I present the materials of this talk, please just uh, let me uh, interest you a little bit where I come from, which is Singapore. So uh, this is the world map and Singapore is actually located over here in the world map. And if my geography is right, the conference, if it is held physically, it should be around this area in Brazil. So we are actually about uh, 16,000 uh, kilometers apart. And uh, I would like to uh, uh, have an opportunity to visit Brazil in the future. And I would like to invite uh, everyone to also consider visiting us in Singapore in the future. Just to entice you to visit Singapore, let me just show a few pictures of Singapore. So this is the view of Singapore on daytime. It is facing the central business district. Singapore is not a big place. It's just one island. If you drive from the west to the east, it will take about one hour. From the north to the south, it will take about half an hour. It's a very green island. The government plants a lot of trees for us to enjoy. Uh, but the island is not so big and there is 5 million people living in the island. So you can see many high rise buildings in Singapore. So around this time in Singapore, uh, which is uh, at uh, night, so this will be the view uh, of Singapore and there's a lot of lights. And I just would like to highlight this, uh, maybe a, a interesting looking statue, which is the icon of Singapore. This is a mix between a lion and a mermaid. So this is called a merlion. And then uh, the back, background is actually the Central Business District of Singapore. And the university that I'm working at, Singapore Management University, is actually located uh, very close to where the statue, we can walk to it. And we had an opportunity to organize AAC in 2016. And if you're attending FSC next year, hopefully uh, it will be uh, at least a partially uh, on-site event. Uh, it will be held also in this beautiful Singapore. So please uh, encourage everyone to visit us too in Singapore. And as Rodrigo mentioned, I'm uh, 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 leading the software analytics research group in Singapore. If you're interested to find out more, I will uh, encourage you to just scan the QR code and additional materials will be uh, presented on the websites. 
And our group are very interested to analyze data in uh, various formats at uh, various uh, sources, be it source code, be it uh, uh, Bugzilla or issue reports, be it execution traces, how developers work together in a network. And we want to analyze all this data for two main purposes. The first purpose is to inform decision makers and developers uh, about insights that we can gather from the data. And the second thing is to build automated tools that can help improve software quality, that can help improve developer productivity. So these are the two things that we are interested in. Uh, we are working in the intersection of uh, this uh, three uh, different fields like software engineering primarily, but also in artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. Uh, we analyze uh, a number of topics like bug finding, bug repair, bug report analysis, also code summarization. Uh, we also perform empirical studies, either looking at the data or interviewing developers, surveying developers. We also work uh, on AI area, application of software engineering in AI, and also some more traditional topics in AI, like social network analysis, pattern mining, and so on. And more recently, uh, also we work on cybersecurity, trying to understand, for example, what is the security risks of using a third party library and also how to discover vulnerabilities and repair them and Android security. So these are a few topics that we are interested in. And in this uh, talk, uh, I'm very happy to be able to present some of the work that uh, we have done and also others have done in the area of bug finding and repair and also in the area of bug report analysis and I'm uh, very much welcome all the inputs and hopefully we'll have an interesting discussion after the talk. So uh, the team again is living with bugs, how AI can help. I guess I do not need to convince uh, everyone that software bugs are really prevalent and they are not uniform. They actually come in various shapes and sizes. Some are not so harmful, some are quite harmful, but a number have also disastrous consequences. These numbers were reported from about two decades ago that say that this buggy software costs users, vendors, a lot of sum of money, like $60 billion annually. And I believe these numbers now is much higher. The reason is because uh, software is now getting more ubiquitous, it's getting more applied in various areas and uh, software getting more complex. So the bugs actually cost a lot more uh, money. So certainly it's important to deal with uh, software bugs. The question is, uh, can AI help? Well, uh, the answer is uh, yes. And in this talk, I'm gonna highlight like what are the different ways that AI can help and what are some opportunities for future work in my perspective. And uh, one of the area where AI can help is to identify bugs. So uh, I'm gonna highlight later, how can we identify misuses of an API? So API is a frequent way for us to reuse software, but sometimes uh, developers that design that API and developers that use the API has a miscommunication. And as a result, there is this API misuses. So how can AI help to identify those misuses? And I'm gonna talk also a little bit about the identification of defective commits. And I'm gonna talk about also resolution of bugs. So after these bugs are identified, how can AI help in the resolution process? And this resolution process often includes multiple steps. The bugs need to be assigned to the developers, the developers uh, need to interact with other developers, developers need to finally repair the bugs and the bug reports or the issue reports need to eventually be closed. Can AI also be used in this aspect in order to automate the, this task? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this later too. And the use of AI in software engineering is uh, recently a more and more uh, prevalent in the industry as well. Actually, there is this term here, AI ops, AI for IT operation that is very popular in the industry. There are various definitions given for this uh, new buzzword, AI ops. But according to this MIT Technology Review Insight, it is being characterized as a broad category of tools and components. There are two key components there, which is AI and analytics. And the goal are a few, including to automate certain processes in order to detect and also resolve problems and also to prevent costly outages. 
So I'm going to highlight uh, later a uh, little bit about how AI can be applied to some of these uh, problems and uh, what are some opportunities for future work. So before that, let me just highlight to everyone about the typical bug life cycle uh, put in a simplified way. And then we can consider where AI can be put into this life cycle. Well, typically uh, a user or a tester or a developer may encounter a certain failure or a symptom of a bug. And these uh, people typically would uh, report it uh, through various means. And one way is actually through an issue tracking system. For example, Bugzilla, Jira, uh, GitHub also has an issue tracking systems. And then uh, these issues need to be assigned to developers. And developers need to check this issue. Is it a duplicate issue? Uh, is this issue valid, right? And who is the best person to deal with this issue? And which components are affected with this issue? So this process is often done manually. And then after a few rounds of iteration, developers working with each other, finally, they're going to submit a uh, commit into a version control system or a code review system. And then eventually, maybe a continuous integration process will start. And then eventually, the bug get resolved and closed. So where can we put AI into this life cycle? Well, actually, we can put AI everywhere. So AI can actually help in these various steps of this life cycle. And in this talk later today, I'm going to talk about how AI can be deployed for discovery of bugs. So how can AI mimic users, testers, developers to identify bugs? And how can we use AI for analyzing bug reports and automating the bug report management process? And uh, finally, I'm going to talk in the final part of uh, this uh, presentation is uh, how uh, AI can actually help developers in fixing or repairing bugs. So first, let me talk about this part of the AI, AI for bug discovery, or for short, I just use this term AI for BD. And I just kind of highlight uh, one of the very recent work. Uh, I'm going to start with that. That was recently accepted at uh, IEEE Transaction on Software Engineering. This is the first time we are presenting it outside the group. And this is about uh, active learning of discriminative subgraph patterns for detection of API misuses. Apologies if you hear some uh, planes flying on the background. I live very close to a military airbase. And then. Uh, uh, yes, so this work uh, is uh, very new, and I'm going to highlight to you how a misuses of an API can be detected. I'm sure everyone agrees that uh, software systems today are not developed from scratch. We are very much grateful for the availability of uh, tons of libraries available out there, uh, because this allows for us to reuse code. However, if the reuse is not done properly, what happens is that uh, there could be bugs or even vulnerabilities. And this is caused because their API may have some constraints. And if these constraints are not followed, the result is that uh, could be bugs, the program can crash, or worse still, an attacker can potentially exploit the corresponding vulnerability. And that's, I'm sure it's important for us to detect them. And there have been a number of work on detection of API misuses. This work that we have just recently got accepted uh, is not the first. There have been a lot of studies on detection of API misuses, and they can be characterized in terms of three main steps. The first thing is that typically we want to mine patterns that describe how an API should be used. And then given these patterns, we want to detect anomalies, right? Violation of these patterns. Not all of the anomalies are misuses or bugs. Some of them are false positives. So one of the key tasks, task number three, is to identify which one is the real bugs and which one are the benign anomalies. And uh, for task number one, what is important is that we need to create an abstraction of how an API is being used. Only after we have created that abstraction, then we can mine patterns. And one common way to abstract API usages is by representing it in the form of graph. So one of the commonly used graph is also referred to as this API usage graph. So given a code snippet at the top, 
uh, we can actually extract a graph that actually describes the API being called and also the vicinity of the API, the related code to that API. For example, a null check after an API is being invoked. And then given all these API usage graphs, we can imagine that we can actually mine frequent patterns. So these frequent patterns uh, could then be used to detect for anomalies. And some of the anomalies can then be identified as uh, misuse or bugs. And uh, in the past, uh, there are a number of studies, they focus on mining patterns from a single repository, and that's good. However, more can be done. And we're actually uh, considering this work by Ammon et al. They try to mine frequent patterns from not only one repository, but many repositories, right? We want to make use of this big code that is available in GitHub. And then uh, they try to mine these frequent patterns and detect these users by looking at deviation from this pattern. This work is great, uh, but they rely on a number of assumptions. The first thing is that they assume that frequent code is correct code. And the second assumption is that code deviating from the frequent patterns is incorrect. Well, this assumption may hold for many cases, but uh, they are often unreliable. Why do I say that? Well, the first reason is that there are often many wrong examples on GitHub. For example, many usages of cryptography APIs on GitHub, they are actually misuses. And we actually analyzed in this uh, paper in Asia CCS 2016, about how developers make use of cryptography inside Android applications. And we find hundreds of issues that can be grouped into a few families. And thus uh, the same is applied for many other projects on GitHub as well. And then the second reason is this, frequent patterns may not represent usage constraints that matter. For example, there could be two pieces of code and these two pieces of code appears very frequently. And the composition of these two pieces of code can be frequent by chance, but they do not mean anything. This is called a spurious pattern. Let me illustrate this with an example. So here we have uh, map.get and printstream.printline. So we often use this too in a Java program. Uh, the composition of these two is frequent because they appear many times, but they do not uh, express any constraints, right? If we violate this pattern, it has no implications on the quality of a code. So uh, what we want to do in this work is actually we want to reduce reliance on frequency. Frequency alone is not enough. So what we're going to do is that we want to mine patterns that are discriminative. What do we mean by discriminative? It means that these patterns appear much more on the correct usage than the misuse, or it appear much more on the misuse than the correct usage. And we also want to do this process called active learning. We want to involve the humans in annotating the data. Of course, we can't ask humans to annotate thousands and thousands of examples that are available on GitHub. It won't be practical. So the idea here is how can we deploy active learning so that the humans can only label a few examples that are powerful enough to enable AI to discriminate between the correct usage and misuse. So this is the high level uh, overview of our approach. We call it actively learn patterns. So we have, uh, or we start with this collection of API usage examples and they are unlabeled. We do not know whether they are correct or incorrect. We can get thousands of them by just uh, deploying or uh, calling the GitHub search engine. And then we're gonna pick a small subset of them to bootstrap the process. And the human will actually label them, either they are correct or they are a misuse. And then after that, we're gonna represent each of these examples as a graph. So every graph can have a label C means it's correct or M means it is a misuse. And then we deploy our discriminative subgraph pattern mining algorithm. And then after that, we're gonna have a process that enables us to pick additional examples 
So this is the active learning part. And this process will then repeat, right, until a stopping criterion is being met. So in this process, we get uh, more and more examples to be labeled. We're going to get better and better patterns, right, until eventually we're going to stop. And we're going to use these patterns to identify misuse and differentiate correct usage from misuse. So let me describe a little bit more about the process. So first, the key question is, how do we pick examples? Right, the dotted box that we have in the previous figure over here, select additional examples. How exactly are gonna we do that? Well, we have a process that rely on two main criteria. So the first thing is that informativeness. So we want to pick examples that are not similar to the examples that are already labeled. Right? Otherwise, it will not carry additional information. And the second thing is that uh, representativeness. So we want to pick examples that are not anomalies, but similar to many other unlabeled examples. So in the paper, uh, it provides more details. How do we model these two criteria into some constraints that we can then solve using a constraint solvers? So the goal is that we want to solve this constraint so that we get a minimal number of examples to label while providing maximum information for the AI algorithm to work. So after we go through this process, we actually have a set of discriminative patterns. So how do we make use of this set of discriminative patterns? How can we use them to differentiate between benign API use and a misuse? Well, we make use of a graph classification process. So given an API usage, we're gonna extract an API usage graph from it. And then we're gonna match it against the mine patterns. So we're gonna create a feature vector for each of the API usage graph. And each of the element of the feature vector corresponds to one of the mine patterns. If a mind pattern appears in the API usage graph, then we're gonna put a label one for it. Otherwise, we're gonna put a label zero for it. So this is an illustration of it. So given one API usage graph, we're gonna match it against uh, this many patterns. And in this example here, the API usage graph matches with the second discriminative pattern and the last discriminative pattern, but not the others. And that's why we have one and one for the second and the third element of the feature vector, but zero for the others. Right? So we're going to have these vectors and we're going to have some of them that are labeled and we can use it to learn an AI model, which is a classif classifier to discriminate between the correct usage and the misuse. So does the approach work? Well, we tried on this 57 APIs and we crawl uh, GitHub, and for each one of them, we got 2,000 plus usage examples. Of course, it's impossible for us to label each one of them. It will be too much work. But with uh, our solution, ALP, it will automatically pick important examples to be labeled for it to build a good AI model that can differentiate between correct usage and a misuse. So we just need two iterations of ALP, each one of them on average labeled 23 examples. And we have this holdout set that we kept. So this holdout set is not used in the training process. This is used to test the effectiveness of our solution. And we have about uh, 500 examples, right? Some are correct and some are misuses. And we compare it with the state of the art and we find that we can boost the precision and recall substantially. And uh, this is just a nutshell of the evaluation. For more details, I'd like to invite everyone to read our 20 plus page uh, paper. The reviewers give us a lot of input so that we add additional experiments. And uh, this is just one kind of uh, box that AI can help to find API misuses. There are many other bugs that AI can find. So some of them are uh, done by, uh, by our uh, previous work. For example, in this work, uh, we actually uh, identify a misuses of main constants in the Linux kernel. And we actually reported many of these misuses to developers and developers have accepted and corrected those cases that we reported. 
And uh, this work and the previous work that I've presented, I try to identify bugs at the statement level. So the statement that is buggy. We have also tried to identify bugs at the file level, meaning that a file that contains a box. And this is work that we did uh, for cross-project defect prediction. And we have also looked into cases where we want to identify bugs at the commit level. And uh, the last one uh, at, uh, presented last year is actually we look into effort aware, uh, just in time defect identification. And then we apply it as a case study in Alibaba, which is uh, one of the giant tech company in China. So this is uh, part one. And let me just uh, give like a few takeaway. So first of all is that uh, AI can be used to uh, identify bugs, different kinds of bugs, API misuse, misuse of name constants and so on, and uh, at different granularities, buggy statement, buggy files and buggy commits. The idea is that we want to make use of data, which is either labeled or unlabeled. And then we want to try to model and be able to differentiate between the cases that are buggy and cases that are benign. And we see, we actually are very fortunate to have this GitHub repository to mine, but uh, please kindly note that not all code in GitHub are of high quality and thus our AI solution need to be able to differentiate those things that we can use and those things that we need to ignore. And uh, one thing is that a frequency may not be enough. We may need to be able to differentiate better. And uh, one thing that is good is to have a human in the loop solution. And the idea is that humans must label a few things, but not too much things. And how can we select this few important examples for human to label? So this is just uh, some thoughts that I have for AI uh, for a bug discovery. So please allow me to also present some work uh, that have been done in our group and also beyond on how to use AI for the next step of this bug life cycle, namely bug report analysis. So the bug has been detected, a failure has happened, a, a user or a tester or developer has logged a bug report. So how can AI help uh, after that step has been done? Well, recently we have done a literature review on how practitioners perceive automated bug report management techniques. So in this paper, we try to analyze and characterize research that has been done on uh, AI being applied to bug reports. And we want to also ask practitioners, do they think these techniques matters? Can these techniques uh, help them in their day-to-day -day activities? So let me first present the literature review part. So we look into seven journals and 10 conferences spanning a period of more than 10 years we pick uh, uh, the regular papers only because there are already so many of them. And we pick papers that propose new tools. And then we then uh, done this uh, card sorting process in order to identify categories uh, that can emerge uh, from these papers. So we analyze a total of 115 papers and we can put them into 10 categories. And we find that there is a rich uh, 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 spectrum of topics where people have been applying AI for bug report analysis. And let me share some of them with you. So one category is uh, suppose a, a user has typed something or maybe the user uh, has a certain failure, but maybe the user doesn't know how exactly to write a good bug report. So how can AI help the user to complete the bug reports or to make sure that they include sufficient details so that developers can do their necessary tasks? So that's one category. Another category is a duplicate bug report detection. So uh, multiple people may be facing the same issue. Each of them report a bug. This result in duplicate bug reports, right? They are syntactically different, but semantically the same. And there is also a line of work on prioritization of bug reports because developers sometimes overwhelm with so many bug reports, they do not know which one to work first. And how to assign bug reports? Sometimes there could be hundreds of developers. So how do we pick the right one with the right expertise to deal with the bug report in the shortest time possible? And there is also work done on how to predict the fixed time of a developer to fix a bug. And there is a line of work also on trying to identify the buggy files given the bug report. 
And there is a work done on trying to link the bug reports with the commits in the version control system that either introduce the bug or fix the bug. And uh, another category is how to categorize bug reports. So bugs come from uh, different families. And one of the important categories is this thing called security bug reports. So how can we identify the security bug reports? And there is a line of work on uh, bug report summarization. A bug report can be quite short. However, often developer discuss a lot after that. So overall, if we consider the bug reports and all the comments, it can be a very long document. And this document is not only uh, write once and forget in the future. It could be the case that developers may want to look back uh, for a bug that has happened before that is similar to a new bug and try to understand right, how they have fixed the same bug before or a similar bug before by reading through the comments. But the comments are too long. How can we summarize them? So there have been a number of work on that. And there's also a line of work on uh, predicting of a reopened bug. So a bug has been closed. It can be opened again. So because the fix is not complete or because it creates some uh, additional impact that is not wanted. So how can we predict that? And in our study of this 100 plus papers, we find that the most popular one is this bug localization followed by bug assignment and so on. So if you're interested to find out more about these papers, uh, please uh, just scan the QR code there. And then uh, there is a category of those papers based on our literature review. And the next thing that may be interesting is actually we want we talk to practitioners through survey and interview try to understand that, hey, researchers have done all these things that uh, we believe to be cool and interesting. Uh, does it, do these techniques matter to them? So we actually uh, uh, created a, a survey and then we provide a description of each of these techniques and ask them whether research on this topic will be, is important or not important. So we have a five point Likert scale, one very unimportant and five is very important. And then we can find that developers generally perceive these techniques as important or very important. Like for bug localization, the mode is very important. Uh, for uh, the next uh, three, the mode is important. For bug fixing time prediction, the mode is neutral. Uh, but you can see that the more people say it to be important or very important than unimportant or very unimportant. And we can see also a similar trend uh, with the remaining five techniques, right? And we also talk to them uh, uh, with an interview, try to understand their constraints, their concern, and what we can do as a community to proceed further in this area of AI for bug report analysis. We have also done uh, this uh, Scott Knott ESD test to see if uh, practitioners perceive this bug report management techniques differently. And we come up, uh, or the Scott Knott ESD test come up with four categories that are distinct from each other. So the group one, which developer perceives to be the most important for day, their day-to-day -day activities, is a technique that can help them to find out where is the buggy file. Because sometimes there's so many of them. The second is how to identify duplicates and how can help developers or users to automatically complete a bug report that is good and how can we link a bug report to a commit? So these are the four categories that are deemed to be very important for the practitioners. So just a little bit of a takeaway here. So there is a lot of papers on analyzing bug reports that come to different categories and they are perceived as important by practitioners. And the top three of them is this bug localization, bug commit linking, and this duplicate bug report detection. So please just allow me to just spend like a, a few minutes to talk about this uh, line of work on bug localization that the practitioners perceive as uh, very important. So I call this like AI for BL or bug localization. And there have been a lot of work on this beyond the one that we survey. And actually there is uh, this two lines of work that is very big. And some of them even won an uh, ACM six of impact paper award or most influential paper award, right? One line of work is called spectrum-based fault localization. I believe uh, uh, one of the paper won uh, 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 a six of impact paper award a couple of years ago, and also the uh, most influential paper award in AAC 2019. And there's another line of work called information retrieval bug localization. 
So let me first present uh, information retrieval back localization and spectrum back localization. And then in this work, what we try to do is that we actually see that there are synergy between these two techniques and we can marry them together. And if we combine them together, the result is better. And I'm just gonna uh, highlight uh, what are some of the lessons that we learn after this work uh, later. So first of all, let me talk a bit about this information retrieval back localization. So it takes a zip for this uh, back reports and also a corpus containing a source code files. And this IR based back localization technique will actually compare the back report with the source code files. And the goal is to identify the buggy file, right? So we produce a rank list. And then if the result is good, the buggy file should appear very early in this rank list, right? So this is one family. Uh, information retrieval. Why information retrieval? Because we treat the bug report as the query and the source code files as the document to be retrieved. Yet another family is this called spectrum-based bug or fault localization. Uh, its input is actually a program spectra. So it assumes that we have a set of test cases. It could be a regression test. We run each one of them. And for every test, we can know actually which lines or which program elements are being executed. And we also can know the outcome of the test, either it's a passing test case or a failing test case. Right? So here, for example, we have four tests, T1 to T4. And for T1, the basic block one and basic block two are executed. Basic block three, four, and five are not executed. And the outcome of the test case is passed. Right? And the outcome of the other three test cases are pass, pass, and fail. So from this information, we can do some statistical analysis in order to identify which program element is a buggy one. So in this work that we presented at uh, FSC about uh, five, six years ago, what we tried to do is that we tried to uh, combine uh, all these two together. Right? So we have uh, training data, we have a corpus of methods, we have a bug report and we have a program spectra. And it's typically the case that we have all this because when developer receive a bug report, usually the first thing that the developer would do is to check whether it works for him or her or uh, it is a real bug. And in the process, they can create a failing test cases and they also have a regression test that they can run. And for our method called adaptive multimodal bug localization, we work at this granularity of methods. So we do not want to return files because it's too big. One file can have so many methods, so many lines. We do not want to return statements because it's quite narrow and it, developers may need to read the context of that line as well, right? So we think that methods is a nice uh, granularity level. And our solution has these two interesting features. Uh, one of them is it is adaptive. Many of the techniques, uh, not only for uh, bug localization, they are one size fits all, right? So the, there's an AI model, all the parameters are fixed. So no matter what's the input, the model parameters remain the same. But the fact is that bugs are, comes in various shapes and sizes. So a one size fits all solution may be suboptimal. So in this work, we actually built an adaptive approach. One of the features of this AML is that we want to combine information from bug reports. We want to combine information from the test cases in such a way so that they can synergize among uh, each other. And we actually get inspired by uh, this uh, phrase from uh, a work done by Parnin and Orso. They highlight that future research should automatically highlight terms related to failures. So information retrieval, there is this concept uh, called the weight of a word, how important is the word? More important words should have a higher weight, less important words should have a lower weight. So how can we adjust the weight of the words by making use of this execution traces? Some of them fails, some of them are successful, right? So we incorporate a new weighting scheme based on this suspiciousness score. And this is the structure of AML. We have four boxes inside it. One is analyzing text only. Another is analyzing program spectra. Another is called a suspicious word, meaning we try to combine the text and the program spectra together. And then we have an integrator component that's gonna combine these three components in an adaptive way. So these are uh, the different parts of AML. 
So for AML text and AML spectra, we just use standard solutions because that's not the main contribution of the work. And for AML suspicious word, we created this concept of the word suspiciousness. So we want to identify uh, some words in the bug report and files that are deemed to be suspicious, and we identify them using the program spectra. And after we have identified the words that are suspicious, we want to identify the methods that are suspicious. The details are available in the paper, and uh, the integrator component actually tried to put these three things together, right? And we just do a simple approach. We just do a weighted sum. We have the alpha, the weight for AML tags, beta, the weight for AML spectra, and gamma, the weight for suspicious words. So these are the parameters of the model. Then you may wonder, so what is the adaptive part here of AML? Well, the adaptive part is actually the fine tuning of this alpha, beta, and gamma. They are not set constant for all inputs, but rather given a new bug report, a new failed test cases, we're gonna identify the K closest historical fixed reports. And then we're gonna find the value of alpha, beta, and gamma that works best for those K instances. And we're gonna use it adaptively for this a new bug report. And we identify in such a way but by not having a one size fit all parameters, the result is better. So we experimented with large projects and more than 150 bucks. Each of them has like thousands of methods. And we compare with the number of state of the art baselines at that time. And we can actually identify that our solution can actually outperform the best performing baseline by a substantial margin from 20% to 40% in various uh, evaluation measures. And uh, uh, that was work done six years ago. So you may wonder like, uh, what have we been doing after that? Well, after that, uh, we have tried to look into uh, ways for us to improve the machine learning part. And we propose this idea of this uh, network cluster multimodal bug localization that was presented at uh, TSC. Basically, we have uh, created multiple similarity graphs among box reports and also among source code files. And then we use it uh, to, in order to better identify the location of the box and tune the parameters better using a network lasso procedure. And we also recently look into this issue of a cold start. So all these techniques assume that you have uh, thousands of bug reports to train. So I'm a new developer creating a new repository. I have no bug reports on my repository. How can I use these techniques, right? So uh, we have uh, investigated this uh, cold start problem and we use this thing called transfer learning. So how can I learn from another repository, which has a lot of bug reports and apply to my repository who has very few bug reports. And we have this deep transfer learning process and uh, very new, very recently, we work with uh, engineers at Adobe. So they want to have a bug localization solution deployed in your company. And uh, we talk to them and they say that, hey, actually we are not using all the data. Inside Adobe, we have additional data. Could you use this additional data? Like they have commit messages, they have comments in bug reports, and uh, they, have, uh, they have bug reports that are not submitted by developers, but by customers. Right, so can the technique work? And we design a solution that can uh, work uh, on their data better than the baselines. So these are just some work that we did on this area. And uh, some takeaway, uh, basically uh, something that I can learn from this uh, papers is that we do not want to, uh, to ignore certain kind of data sources. Sometimes uh, together is better than alone. But the idea is that when we include additional data sources, Often there could be interference that is not wanted, right? Often maybe there is data quality issue. So how can we blend them in a seamless way so that overall the result is better, right? And not worse. And uh, then uh, we also identify an adaptive solution is very powerful. So we do not want to fix the model parameters for all inputs, but if possible, we want to tune these model parameters adaptively. So in our experiment, we only tune this alpha, beta, and gamma but there could be many other parameters that could be tuned adaptively. So that's for AI for bug localization. I think I still have some time. I'm gonna talk about this AI for bug fixing. And uh, I, I think this is a very exciting topic. 
because uh, according to this BBC Science Focus, this is the dream that people have been dreaming for decades. So they say that uh, robots that can repair themselves, it's called this von Neumann machine, has been the idea since the late 1940s, right? So people have been dreaming to have this automated program repair solution that can work uh, for robots and also for software today. And there is an article here from the communications of the ACM that uh, argue or present how this automated program repair can fit into the day-to-day -day activities of a developer. So a new developer tried to make a commit, the commit is being rejected. How can AI help the developer to make the right commit? And the work uh, is being uh, pioneered. I believe this is one of the pioneering paper that won the most influential paper award in ICSI 2019 which is uh, automatically finding patches using genetic programming. So the idea is that uh, we have a buggy program, we have a test cases. So we want to mutate the buggy program and we want to run the test cases at the same time for all the repair candidates until we identify the candidates that pass all the test cases. And in such a way, we can use a lot of machinery in order to automatically repair the bug guided by the test cases. And there have been a number of papers in this direction. These are a few uh, pioneering papers. And this work has been shown to be very helpful in identifying and repairing bugs. Uh, however, just like any other work, there are some limitations. So one of the limitations is that it can be affected by overfitting. So when we try to mutate the program, it can overfit the test cases because no test cases is complete, right? By nature, test cases is incomplete. And because of that, it may produce nonsensical patches. So for example, this is a real bug from Defects4j uh, benchmark. So developers actually make a common mistake. I made this mistake before. Well, basically the operators, rather than greater than, uh, developers put greater or equal. And because of this, there is one of the test case that fails. And it fails because a convergence exception is being raised. Right, But if we fit this to an uh, automatic program repair solution, the machine will, may overfit the test data. How will it do that? Well, it may overfit the test data by trying to make changes so that the test cases pass, but those changes do not fix the bug. So what is one way the machine can do that? The machine can make mistakes. Well, the machine can happily delete through new convergence exception. And if that's the case, then all test cases pass. But will the bug be resolved? Well, no. Actually, now we have two bugs. Bugs in the condition of the if statement and bug in the body of the if statement. So this is called the overfitting problem. The second problem is that often it takes a long time to produce patches. Why? Because there could be thousands of candidates and we want to have test cases or test suite as complete as possible. So we may need to run like hundreds or thousands of test cases. So thousands of test cases, thousands of uh, repair candidates, right? The combination is a lot of things to run. So it takes a long computation time. And it also do not consider the bug fix history. So none of us are born to be a good programmer or a good debugger. So we learn through our experience. When we make mistakes, we learn from it. We learn from the experience of others, how others do debugging, then we can do better. But these AI techniques, uh, they did not learn from developers or they did not learn from itself when they're trying to repair a bug. So motivated by these issues and challenges, we actually proposed this idea in 2016 on this history-driven program repair. The idea is this, the same, we have the same input, the buggy program, the set of test cases, but we just have one more thing. And that one more thing is a knowledge base. And this knowledge base can be automatically learned by mining version control systems. And we will use this knowledge base in order to mutate the buggy program. So, and the mutation does not rely too much on the test cases, but also on this knowledge base. And by using this knowledge base, we can actually learn common sense that machine do not have, but humans have, right? So we can use this knowledge base to do that. 
And then eventually, uh, we do not want to run all the test cases because it will take a long time. We just want to run a select few test cases. As a result, it can be faster and you can also avoid the issue of nonsensical patches because the knowledge base can tell us, uh, I delete the body of the if statement. Now the if statement is an empty one. Is it a sensible one, right? And the knowledge base can tell us, well, it may not be sensible. And then we can avoid doing that, right? So our approach has these three phases. One is the bug fix history extraction. Another is bug fix history mining and bug fix candidate generation. So for history extraction, we just pick popular Java projects at that time. We identify uh, likely bug fixing commits by means of some heuristics. And we get uh, 3000 bug fixes from 700 plus projects. And then uh, for phase number two, for every single bug fix, we actually have two versions, the version before the fix, the version after the fix. We create an abstract syntax tree for each one of them. And then we do a diff by using this gum tree, an AST diffing algorithm. It produces a script that can convert the AST before the fix to the AST after the fix. And then we then process it further to result in the graph. So given a collection of bug fixes, through this process, we can have a collection of graphs and we run this graph mining process. We get this graph patterns that we then use as a knowledge base. So how do we use this knowledge base to guide the repair process? Well, we first take this buggy program, we then mutate it, and then we then check the repair candidates against the fixed patterns. We want to see, is this repair candidates uh, commonly appearing before, right? By checking against the fixed patterns. And we're gonna pick those that matches many of the fixed patterns, either in full or in part. And then we're gonna have this validation step. We just run a subset of the test cases and we identify those uh, uh, candidates that pass the validation step and output it. So we're gonna repeat this process multiple iterations until a stopping criteria is being met. The stopping criteria could be enough number of past candidates are found, or it could be the process has been running for so long, let's stop it. Or it could be I've run the iteration n number of times, let's stop it, right? So this is the stopping criteria. And does it work? Well, this is the results. So uh, we can actually identify many more uh, bugs, real bugs, uh, and prepare them as compared to GenProc and PAR. And why does the technique work well? Well, uh, the GenProc and PAR suffer from this uh, plausible but incorrect fixes. Plausible, meaning that all test cases pass, but the fix is not correct. And they also suffer from timeout because they need to run all the test cases. While HD repair rely partially on the test cases, but also on this knowledge base to guide the repair process. So what are some lessons that uh, we have learned when we're doing this uh, work? But before that, let me just highlight uh, some of the follow-up work. So we are very happy that actually uh, there is the work done by Facebook, which is called Get a Fix, that extend the idea that we have they also uh, uh, learn templates based on previous fixes that human developers make. So this was three years or two years after our paper. And finally, they deploy this into Facebook and they can actually repair many applications uh, inside uh, Facebook, many bugs. And if we are carrying a Facebook app in our phone, then uh, some of the bugs have been repaired by these techniques. And in our group itself, we have looking also into uh, different types of bugs. Uh, it's just that many of these automatic program repair solution techniques, uh, the accuracy may not be that high. But uh, if you want it to be acceptable by developers, developers often require a higher level of accuracy. So we were thinking at that time, what can we do to make the accuracy higher? well, we can make the learning process better, right? So that's one way to look at the problem. Another way to do it is actually, can I incorporate human knowledge into the process? Yes, we can do that. Another thing is that, can I focus on a specific family of bugs? And for those bugs, I can do my job very well. And that's what we did. 
In this Asia CCS paper, we just focus on cryptography misuses. We leverage domain knowledge by creating some templates for the program repair to work with. And we can actually identify hundreds of issues with cryptography, and we can fix hundreds of them. We send them back to the developers, and more than 100 developers actually accepted our recommendation and made the change. And we also try to extend this work to uh, not only one kind of vulnerability, but six kinds of vulnerabilities. Uh, for example, uh, cryptography, SQL injection vulnerability, and a few others in this SORIX 2017 paper. They are all in the cybersecurity venue. And more recently, we look into how can we repair a special kind of software called the smart contracts, which was recently uh, accepted at Tulsa. So these are some lessons that uh, we learn in the process that uh, we can uh, try to repair different kinds of bugs. And the key thing here that we find interesting is to learn a knowledge base. If we can learn this knowledge base, either fully by machine or machine together with domain knowledge, it can boost the accuracy substantially. And uh, this knowledge base can reduce the likelihood of this uh, search based process to produce nonsensical patches. So uh, in these three parts of my talk, I've highlighted how AI can be used for discovery bugs, how AI can be used to uh, manage the bug reporting and management process, and how AI can be used uh, in the fixing process. Uh, maybe I still have a little bit of time to talk about a little bit about some opportunities and open problems. So uh, these are some problems that I'm interested in working and I, I, I hope I could interest you to work on this problem as well because these are a uh, challenging problem. One of the problem that I find is very challenging but is important is how to provide explanations. Many of these techniques are black box, right? Uh, this is an API misuse, uh, why? Maybe we can give uh, a, like a graph patterns to the developers. This graph patterns is like this, that's why it is uh, misused. But will developers accept it? Maybe yes, maybe no, right? Defect prediction, uh, this uh, particular commit is buggy. Developers say, why? Uh, because the, there's this feature that is high. Is it acceptable by developer? Maybe yes, maybe no, right? So I think there is more work that is needed that is intersection not only of AI and software engineering, but possibly also HCI. So how can we present the information in such a way that is explainable? And the explanation shouldn't be one size fits all. When we are teaching our students, we are not giving a one size fits all explanation. Uh, so if for the students that are stronger, we're going to give uh, maybe a higher level explanation, but students that maybe are technically weaker, then maybe we need to provide more detailed explanations. So how can we adjust this explanation depending on the need of developers? I think this is a big problem and more work are needed here. Another thing that I think is very important to deal or to address is how do we integrate all these techniques into the developer workflow? So often in, uh, yeah, including my work, often what happened is that we have this uh, prototype, right? And uh, it works to some extent, but if it's not integrated into the developer workflow, then it's less likely that developers can use it. And integrating things in the developer workflow may not be easy. We need to understand their concerns. We do not want to introduce something that uh, impedes their activities rather than improving their productivity. So how do we do that? So I think more work are needed in this, in this aspect. And nowadays, uh, it's actually the era of uh, a lot of videos, uh, images, and many of the techniques we have so far are actually relying on text. So I think there's more work that is needed to analyze like a new way to report bugs. Right? Some people, when they report bugs, they go to their phone and they turn on Twitter and then they tag uh, this company, hey, your program crash right? <laughs> or something like that. So how can we analyze that kind of uh, uh, bug reports, maybe through Twitter or maybe through app review or maybe through like in WeChat, you can take a screenshot and send it. So how can we analyze that kind of images? Or uh, there is some tools that allow one to do video recording and send it but we don't have this capability or at least not so many papers ha has presented techniques that can deal with rich media or social media and uh, be able to uh, help developers to live with bugs at these various uh, steps of the life cycle. 
And I think there's also a need for more industrial collaborations. And then with industrial collaboration, we can actually get additional insights. So it could be a variation of the problem we solved before, but it matters for them. For example, in this work uh, uh, with WeChat, uh, they are interested to detect uh, issues that are gonna emerge. So before it emerge, we want to detect it early, but we don't want to detect false positive. So what happened is that if we can detect, there will be like 5,000 complaints about this problem, like, uh, like a few hours before it shoots up or a day before it shoots up, then uh, the, the developers are interested about it. Because there are so many issues, they cannot deal with all of them. They need to prioritize. So how do they prioritize? They want to prioritize fixing the problem that a lot of people will complain tomorrow, right? So how to do that? So this is uh, one work that uh, we have identified, but I think by working with industry, we can identify more of such interesting problems that may not fit into the 10 categories that I presented earlier through the literature review. And another thing is uh, AI can be applied everywhere, right? And we want to think about like new tasks. Uh, what are some tasks where AI can be helpful? And uh, for example, this is a work that uh, we did uh, about two years ago. Uh, we look into how can we help developer respond to app reviews. So uh, when uh, people enter an app, then the developer need to respond. Otherwise, the person will give a very low star, right? But if there's an acknowledgement from developers, then uh, maybe then the star will not be affected. So how can we generate this app review response automatically? And this app review response can be helpful. For example, if there is a workaround, then we can actually, AI can tell the user, hey, I know these features are broken now, but there is a workaround that you can do. Or it could be the case that uh, maybe the user just say, oh, this, uh, this app is bad. And maybe this bot can actually ask the user, what do you mean by bad? Can you provide more information? Your, your, your business is very important to us, something like that. Right, so I think there is more that can be done in this area, try to identify new tasks where AI can be helpful. I think we now live in a very exciting uh, time for uh, AI being applied to software engineering or to debugging. Uh, I like to think it's uh, possibly similar to the early 1900s for this area of aeronautics. So this picture is when the Wright brothers uh, first uh, fly their airplane, right? Anybody remember how long that flight lasts? Well, it's not one hour, right? It's just 12 seconds before it land back, right? But it's a breakthrough, right? And with decades of hard work, we can have international travel, uh, hopefully resume fully very soon. And then uh, we can see that maybe something similar is happening today. We have seen that uh, there is a, like adoption of the software engineering uh, AI techniques in the industry, like Facebook has this get a fix and we are all excited with GitHub having this uh, co-pilot like AI pair programming. Uh, it's not in the hands of everybody, all the developers today, but hopefully with the community effort, right, we can make this a reality. Well, AI can be in the hands of developers, well, developers can be more productive, create more reliable systems together, hand in hand with AI. So before I end, let me just uh, make a brief like uh, advertisements. There is a number of openings. So if you're interested, please feel free to just contact me. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, some of a group members, some have graduated and moved to various places. And these are just acknowledgements of the images with the CC license that I use. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Any questions, comments, and advice are very welcome. Thanks so much, David. Of course, I was already expecting a great talk, but I have to say that it is it superseded my expectations, okay? Thank you very much. It was, it was really nice to see the advances on the use of artificial intelligence to, to software engineering and also see how we are going to, to bring these results to predictions as well to the industry. Okay, So we can now we have some time for questions. Uh, Ingrid, please, could you ask your question? So, um, hello, uh, good morning and good evening, David. Uh, thank you for the great talk. It's the, the amount of work that you, together with your group, uh, have, have been doing like, is, is impressive. Um, and uh, there is a question that disturbs me for a long time. Uh, and it's a great opportunity to have an expert to, 
to answer that to me. So it's about this uh, bug localization and bug prediction uh, techniques. So actually, uh, like this kind of work have been around for quite a long time. And uh, what they predict is this method or even this class uh, likely have has a bug. And uh, I can't see how this can be integrated mm -hmm. into a real software project. Because if you think like developers and teams are always like rushing to uh, deliver new features. And then when you simply say, okay, this might, be, might have a bug, the developer has to stop, look at the thing, try to come up with a test case that is going to show that the code is actually broken and then fix the bug, while there are so many other things to be done at the, like at the same time. Uh, so what's your view on that? Uh, like, I understand that it, this might be a step to get somewhere else, but like this kind of work has been around for quite a while already. And, um, uh, what's your view and uh, how are we going to actually use this kind of approach in practice? Yes, so uh, thank you very much for a very uh, good question, Ingrid. And uh, I, I agree with you that uh, I think uh, more needs to be done to demonstrate the effectiveness of these techniques in practice. Uh, you mentioned two different techniques. Uh, one is the bug localization and the other one is uh, uh, defect prediction. Uh, uh, but from your description uh, 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 at the later part of your comment, I guess you're more interested about the defect prediction, like uh, like developer receiving this alert that, hey, the commit is buggy or there is a bug here, what can we do with it? And uh, I think uh, this uh, can be useful in the several scenarios, although it's not perfect. Like uh, for example, uh, developers may be given, there is a study uh, being done, I think by Shihab et al. Well, they work with an industry and they identify riskiness of a commit. So like when a commit is made, maybe there is a riskiness level and probably when, when the level reaches a certain point, developers may want to reread or recheck uh, whether uh, that commits are really uh, uh, buggy and maybe do more thorough code review. And I think uh, that was uh, uncovered by their study. Uh, I think that was done together with uh, BlackBerry and I think with uh, RIM, with RIM Research in Motion and then uh, the manufacturer of BlackBerry at that time. And then there have been a number of other studies where it shows it can be uh, useful. We also did a study uh, together with, uh, uh, with uh, a Chinese uh, telecom company and uh, the developers actually made use of it and uh, tried to use it. Uh, but uh, one problem is this, a, this thing of trust. So I uh, think the problem that AI and human, they, we don't trust AI too much uh, because one thing is the AI cannot explain to us. The AI, I, I'm doing very heavy work now, right? And this AI say, hey, our work is no good, right? Imagine we have a friend that tell us uh, you are bad and then giving us no reason, right? So maybe we are not happy about it. But that's what AI is doing now, is a black box thing, right? Uh, the, the work is bad, the work is likely to be buggy, but it may not provide some explanation. So I agree with you, more work are needed in this area, especially in providing explanation. And actually when I was uh, uh, thinking about, uh, about your comment, I, I have this in mind, probably the AI should not only highlight uh, things that the developers already know, for example, if a commit is very big, it touch everything and it's likely to be buggy, then developers knows about it already, right? Maybe you should highlight something that is surprising. My commit is just one line, but it may be buggy. Then maybe it's something that I should look at. So probably this aspect, uh, we should think more about it. Like uh, what information do developers really need? I think this needs to be done beyond just uh, software engineering and AI, but need to do more of this field study, uh, talking with developers. Uh, I, I like to think about it. We need to have a, do a requirement engineering step of our research by talking to people, trying to understand what they expect, what is the minimum viable product that they will use. And then uh, this can actually uh, guide the work along. And, and there have been a lot of work done recently uh, and they could be the basis for us to build even further. And maybe we can have this tool being used uh, more widely by everyone. Just my two cents on the top. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is a, another question in the chat. Uh, Jackson, I guess. Would you like to, to ask your question, Jackson? 
Perhaps I, I will read here. So Jackson is asking if you, David, have investigated a possible contribution of same supervised machine learning for bug report sol uh, resolution activities when there are too few label instances, label instances. Yes, yeah. Thank you, uh, uh, Rodrigo and Jackson for a very nice questions also. And um, uh, I think it's very interesting to use this uh, semi-supervised uh, learning. Uh, and uh, there's two ways to do this, I guess. Uh, one way is to uh, actually uh, try to uh, make use of now the current trend of AI, this thing like uh, BERT and also the code BERT, basically pre-trained models. So one can use unlabeled data and use this unlabeled data uh, to, do, uh, to do more, even with uh, very few labeled information. And another thing that is possible is actually by making use of this active learning uh, process. Uh, we have highlighted how to do it for API misuse, but we don't really have uh, a solution for other kinds of uh, debugging or repair. So uh, the goal is when there is a few uh, labeled instances, can we add more labeled instances? Or if not, can we make use of other information uh, so that although the information is so few, we can still make uh, good, uh, good results? I think there have been a few works that uh, on either direction. Uh, for bug reports, for some of the tasks, there are already a lot of examples. Like for bug localization, for many big repositories, they already have a lot of uh, resolved bug reports. But there could be some small repository that have no bug reports. And for those cases, then what we need to do maybe is to transfer learning. So how do we learn from this data that have labels, but the labels are not for the target project that we are interested in. So how can we learn that model, transfer the information to a different domain and apply it? So that's uh, uh, what I think to be some of the possible direction to deal with this limited label data. Uh, active learning uh, by making use of uh, pre-trained models uh, maybe like bird-like, and also uh, the third thing is uh, by making use of transfer learning. Just my two cents. We still have time for questions. Uh, I have a, a question, David. It's more at the meta level. After that, I could ask some more te technical stuff. But currently, I see two kinds of of research lines related to artificial intelligence and soft engineering. Some people are working uh, with the use of artificial intelligence to solve soft engineering problems. And other groups are working with, uh, are exploring soft engineering practices to improve the quality of machine learning solutions, okay? Uh, I, I think that you work in the first group, right? Uh, working with uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence to solve soft engineering problems. But I, I wonder if these lines of research are going to, to converge somehow. What do you think about that? Uh, yes, yeah. Thank you very much for a very good question, Rodrigo. Uh, yes, I think uh, the, the AI for software engineering has been uh, around for uh, like a couple of decades. The MSR is like one of the conference of that. Mm -hmm. And then this uh, software engineering for AI is getting more popular more recently, also in AI venue, in software engineering venue. Uh, and uh, like, for example, how can we test uh, an AI systems and what are some like uh, code smells and AI systems and things like that. Uh, I think they can converge in two different ways. Uh, one way it, that I see it converging uh, is uh, actually we make use of this uh, AI techniques to analyze the repositories of this uh, AI techniques and then try to understand like, for example, uh, what mistakes developer make when they are writing AI software and uh, can we identify uh, bugs in AI software? Uh, can we uh, do kind of testing that we do before for regular software, but we apply to AI software, like for example, metamorphic testings and things like that. So that's one way that I see there is uh, some convergence. Uh, I did just a few work on that direction. There are many others doing that. I think applying like uh, applying AI uh, and software engineering domain insight to help AI develop better AI systems, something like that. So that's one direction. Another mm -hmm. direction that I think uh, uh, it's uh, possible for this uh, direction to converge together 
is basically can we apply uh, AI techniques to uh, to detect uh, problems in the software engineering solutions. Uh, uh, for example, there is this thing called adversarial uh, 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 adversarial example generation. So now we have uh, deep learning models of code. Uh, can we attack them uh, just like people attack like AI system for images? So I think that's also another possibilities where there is a problem that previously was defined only on AI for images, AI for video. Are they also applicable for AI for code? So I think there's also like possible merging. Um, uh, I was also thinking like of a cycle, like uh, AI for software engineering, right? How AI can help improve software engineering and software engineering can help improve AI. Can this actually process go uh, around something like that? Mm -hmm. So I, I haven't like have a concrete idea for that, uh, but uh, I think it would be interesting to see if uh, we use uh, AI, let's say for, uh, localizing uh, bugs, and then can we use some other software engineering technique to improve the quality of the AI techniques to localize bugs? Uh, for example, maybe we can do some uh, kind of metamorphic testing in order to improve the quality of the AI doing uh, bug localization, and the process can repeat. Uh, but I think more thoughts are needed there. But I, I'm excited to see like uh, more interaction. I think in many of the conferences these days, there is a session on AI for software engineering. And there is a session for software engineering for AI. And actually, XC has an area. Uh, I don't know if it's this year or next year. I remember there is one area now, AI for and with, uh, sorry, uh, a, yeah, software engineering for and with AI. <laughs> so it's either AI for software engineering and software engineering for AI. So hopefully we see more of this work coming. Uh, but at, on top of my head, I, I, I do not know uh, of... Uh, of uh, a, a work yet that do a cyclical process where AI improve SE, SE improve AI, AI improve SE back, and how this can be designed together so that the overall system is better. But it's an interesting uh, possibility, I think, in the future. Great. We still have time for questions. Uh, Roberta Coelho, please ask him the question. <laughs> Hello, David. Thank you so Hi. much for your talk. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, the way you you developed your work based on real problems and try to present the result to the developer. It's uh, really inspiring. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, my question is a simple question. It's basically your first background was AI or software engineering. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Okay. So yeah. just this, if you if you started to look at uh, software engineering problems in uh, with a uh, AI vision or the the other way around. Oh yeah, that's a very good uh, question. I have a, a complicated uh, a first uh, uh, thing when I'm doing research. My first research done was actually bioinformatics. So I apply uh, data mining for genomic sequences. And then after that, I, I moved to uh, applied, applying uh, AI uh, to, uh, to help a domain specific language. I was part of a programming language lab. And I guess there in my programming language lab and my PhD, then uh, it tried to merge the two together. So there's programming language also related to software engineering. My previous background is on applied AI. And I see opportunity of applying applied AI uh, into uh, software engineering and into programming language. So uh, yeah, so I guess basically uh, they start together in the same together. package. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any other question? I have another meta question, David. <laughs> I think that I will postpone my technical questions to read you by email or something like that. Okay, so I will ask a, a meta question again. Uh, you mentioned in your talk about uh, 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 some collaborations with the Alibaba Group and also with Adobe, I guess. And could you explain how your, how does your group 
uh, works together with the industry? Yes, I think those are very good questions. So we have a few models when uh, we are working on industry, but the constraints are usually not on our side, but more on their side, uh, because they actually have a lot of uh, requirements sometimes. Uh, one way we work with the industry is uh, sometimes uh, like with Adobe, what happened is I was organizing a, 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 a tutorial with ICSI in 2016 in Austin, Texas. And that is the Adobe person was attending that tutorial. And then I was presenting, this can be done, this can be done. And then they say, yeah, we want to try that within Adobe too. And then uh, that leads to uh, more discussion and eventually work done at Adobe. One limitation with uh, Adobe is that we cannot really uh, just put code into Adobe because uh, their company policy, right? So they need to develop the code. We like discuss the ideas. We discuss how to write the paper. We discuss uh, what experiments are needed, but we cannot really be the one doing it because uh, like it's inside the firewall of Adobe. So that's one model. Another model that we did before with the collaborators in Germany is that like with SAP, then SAP can give us certain access with some NDA being signed and things like that. Then we can have access to the code base. So that's the second model. A third model that I did with Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Research, is actually uh, to visit them and I become their employee. So anything I do, it belongs to them. So and that's the case, then I have access to the, to the, to the people, I have access to the code, uh, as much as my host willing to give me and uh, Microsoft agreed to give to me, then for that period of time, I have access. Another possibility is to send student over to, for example, to Microsoft, and then they can, uh, they can work with them for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. So that's the third model. Like uh, we go there, visit them, become their employee or send our students to be their employee. The fourth model is uh, like the one with Alibaba, Actually, I had a, a visiting student who have graduated, become a professor by himself, and he has a project uh, with Alibaba. So Alibaba gave him money and he wants uh, something to be developed. The, uh, the company wants it done and then they produce something for the company. So this fourth model where well, the company give money and then uh, the, the relationship continues. Another possibility is consultancy. So uh, basically the company gives us uh, uh, some money. We spend some time to work uh, with the company, uh, but often the constraints are on the company and not on us. Uh, I do have one uh, experience where it doesn't work out because before I can do anything with the company, I will not name the company. I need to sign like a long document uh, with a lot of scary wordings and the documents like uh, 20, 30 pages, and then they give nothing. And they cannot promise I can publish the paper. <laughs> so at the end, like uh, probably it's not worth to do that. Yeah, because uh, like uh, it seems that they're gonna protect all their rights and uh, I may get nothing. And this, uh, for, for me, maybe it's okay, but if I involve a student and the student wants to publish that for his or her PhD, then it cannot be done. So that's uh, some of the collaboration models that I have uh, worked with uh, different companies. Perfect. Uh, any other question? So, David, uh, thanks so much again okay, for your great talk. And hope that we can meet face by face again soon. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rodrigo. Thank you very much, uh, everyone who attended the talk and asked very good questions. And I hope to be able to see uh, everyone again, hopefully in the near future, physically. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, maybe next year, hopefully, everything will be back to normal. So thanks so much. Thank you to everyone that attended the David talking. We continue.